Jet Li is a martial arts legend who became an international movie star. He has the aura, he has the authority, he has the looks, and God knows he's got a skill set. His name is inspired by his lightning speed. The speed, the quickness, the execution, and the style. Sheltered as a child, he drove himself to become a Chinese combat champion by just 11 years old. I'm learning martial arts since I was 8 years old, you know, 8 hours a day. He became a hero to Asian fans by playing noble characters on screen. He played a hero from the 19th century, also was a tremendous fighter, sort of like a folk hero. I'm not a hero. <laughs> but to find success in Hollywood, he had to compromise his heroic image. American audiences who didn't know him were thrilled. They loved it. His Asian fans were a little unsure because he was playing such a villain. Now he wonders if he should keep making the violent movies his fans everywhere love to watch. He actually was thinking about becoming a monk and following Buddha's and fat extent. Jet Li, a cultural hero caught between two worlds. In Asia, he's known as someone who's very charitable and very peaceful. In Hollywood, they just know he's kick butt Jet Li. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to lose leads you to where you are today. I believe in story. It's going to make you a star. I'm still trying to figure that out. In December 2004, Jet Li was at the top of his game. Martial arts champion. International movie star. On screen, there wasn't a menace he couldn't conquer. But on the tiny Maldive Islands, a half a world away from Hollywood, Jet Li found himself facing a terribly real threat when a killer wave caught his family on the beach. The wave came in and swept them up, and he, it was all he could do to hold on to his daughter. And he was trying to guide his daughter to safety, and he was hit in the leg by some floating piece of furniture. Jet's quick action saved his daughter's life. 225,000 people died that day in 11 countries bordering the Indian Ocean. Communication to the region was cut off for days, and fans and friends didn't know if Lee was alive or dead. And they didn't know where he was, they didn't hear from him. They thought he was one of the uh, unfortunate who had uh, tragically perished. Somehow this story got distorted, and news leaked out at first that, oh, Jet Li has been killed in this big, devastating tidal wave. But at least he came out alive. He was very lucky to have saved himself and his daughter. Jet and his family were safe. But seeing the carnage left by the Asian tsunami led Jet to dedicate himself to helping others. From then on, Lee's life would never again be only about himself. He told me, life is short, and you got to do for others, and you've got to act on that desire in the present. Jet Li was born on April 26, 1963, in Beijing, China. His given name was Li Lian Ji. He was the baby of the family. There were two older brothers, two older sisters. When Li was just two years old, his father died of a stroke. That was more traumatic than it might seem for even someone in the United States or North America, because in China, it's a strong tradition of family. And without the father as part of the unit, he was looked at as somebody different. Li's mother grew protective of her youngest son and kept him indoors. She sheltered him. She wouldn't let him ride a bike. She wouldn't let him go swimming. He became very timid and shy, and she wouldn't, didn't even like the idea of him going to school. When Lee turned eight, his mother finally allowed him to go to primary school in Beijing. Because the family was poor, the shy boy was forced to wear his sister's hand-me-downs. There was a pair of pants he had to wear at the school, which was clearly girls' pants because there was a zipper down the side uh, rather than the middle, and he'd walk down the hallways at school with his hand covering uh, the zipper so they couldn't tell it was girls' pants. Every summer, Chinese students were assigned to learn a special skill. By chance, Lee was sent to study the ancient martial art of Wu Shu. Tens of thousands of kids are selected for different things or are looked at, you know, so they're put into different programs. Some will practice badminton or table tennis, whatever counts. They didn't want kids just sitting on corners. They wanted to keep them active and give them something that was constructive to do. Wu Shu is a stylized form of martial arts using the fist, sword, and spear. Wushu is sort of a formalized version of martial arts that is a long, long tradition in China and it became sort of the national sport of China and very, very important within the Chinese 
uh, customs and the history. Lee was fiercely determined to please his Wushu masters. At the end of the summer, he was among the few children chosen to go to the Beijing Sports and Exercise School. I learned new martial arts since I was eight years old, you know, eight hours a day. Six days a week, he's, he's working out at the school. He's working day every day. And even when he goes home to see his mother, he still practices. He does certain exercises. He's in a routine where you are perfecting your body. He was small for his age, but he did show an incredible skill for, for his age and for his height in Wushu. He had an amazing affinity for it. He found a competitive streak he wasn't aware that he had until then and uh, really took to it. He was called the child prodigy. He never liked that word. He never felt comfortable with it. A Wushu master named Wu Bin took Lee under his wing. The coach was relentless. Wu Bin had seen you know, something in Jet and really drove him to, to be as successful as he was in, as, as far as a martial arts champion. He understood that with Jet, all he needed to be say a few words, maybe sarcastically like, Jet, you could be doing a lot better than that, couldn't you? And where somebody else might just shrug it off, with Jet, he took this to heart, and uh, he immediately practiced twice as hard. Coach Wu Bin would visit Lee at his home whenever his student wavered. The coach would come to see him, and he said, I don't want to do this anymore. And he said to him, well, that's okay, you don't have to do it, but when you grow up, you have to make a decision. Do you want to be a hero, or do you want to be a panda? And he said, I don't want to be a panda. And he went back to school. <laughs> that was the way his coaches were getting him back. Wu Bin almost took him under his wing and was almost a father figure to him. He pushed him very hard, uh, but I think Jet said he needed that. At age 11, Lee was a rising martial artist in China. His combat skill would soon land the poor Chinese boy half a world away, talking back to President Richard Nixon. <laughs> Jet Li is an international martial arts movie star who started his rise to fame early. At age 11, Jet Li was already one of China's best Wushu martial artists. In 1974, the Chinese government sent Li's Wushu team on a friendship mission to America. They needed to have a better relationship with the United States, hoping to get some trade going back and forth. So they decided uh, to show national pride and also as a goodwill gesture to take some of its top young Wushu students and send them on a tour. The goodwill tour took Lee to the White House lawn, where he was filmed performing Wushu for President Richard Nixon. Nixon went, ha ha, you, I could use a bodyguard, right? You want to be my bodyguard? And Jet Li said, I don't want to be any individual's bodyguard. I want to protect one billion Chinese people. Henry Kissinger was there, and he apparently said to Nixon, he shouldn't be a martial artist or a bodyguard, he should be a diplomat. This made news around the world, and was the point that Jet Li went into national prominence in China. Obviously, back home, they ate it up. The Chinese officials loved what he said, and sort of, uh, it was, uh, we made him like a, almost an overnight hero. Li and his teammates were warned to be wary of their American hosts. China was very closed off then, and in, uh, the Chinese children were actually being taught that Americans were, you know, evil people and uh, to be very careful. He was told, he says, when they were in the hotel room, they said, they're going to be listening to you, so whatever you say, uh, be aware that it might be uh, heard of by the U.S. government. So, he's about 11 years old, he goes, he starts walking around the room and, and he's looking up at this, you know, towards the telephone and he's looking at the TV and he goes, I like chocolate ice cream. I like bananas. He just started telling, he was talking to the windows, right, like this. He, the next day in his room there was chocolate ice cream and bananas. <laughs> so this is like a great memory of the United States as well. Where they, you know, you just say it in the air and out it comes. By now Lee was so advanced at the art of wushu, he was allowed to compete against adults in his first all-around national championship. He was still just 11 years old. He went through all his different steps and paces using his sword and sticks and you know all these different implements that you use during Wushu performance. And without knowing it, he had taken his saber and through one of his gestures, sliced his forehead. When the blood started streaming down his face, he just thought it was sweat. It wasn't until people started you know, yelling and crying and screaming from the, from the audience that he began to suspect something was wrong, but he felt no pain. But it just showed, even at this age, that nothing would stop him. Doctors wanted Lee to drop out of the competition, but he refused. 
The next day he was back in the gym with a bandage on his head. And they would first rub it down with alcohol and other things to sterilize it. He would go through his paces and then as soon as it was through, he would run back to the nurse station. She would give him a shot uh, to protect him with antibiotics and redress his uh, wound. Lee won three non-combat gold medals at the National Wushu Championship that year. He would continue to record five consecutive victories from 1974 to 1978 in competitions open to all ages. Movie producers already were coming to him and saying, oh, Jet, when you grow up, meaning get a little bit taller, and uh, you know, past the childhood, we want to have you in movies. A lot of people kept asking him, when are you going to start making a movie? When are you going to start making a movie? Because it's almost a natural progression. If you do martial arts, you can become a stuntman, you can become a choreographer, or you can become a stunt performer on movies. And so I think eventually it got into his mind. Martial arts movies were hugely popular across Asia in the 70s, largely thanks to Bruce Lee, who had died in 1973 at just 32 years of age. The Chinese government was looking for the next heroic film star. Jet Li and several others were commandeered and put into this film that was China's great thrust into modern filmmaking. When I was 17, I started making my first movie called The Shaolin Temple. And in Asia, it's very successful. 50 million Chinese crowded into theaters to see Li star in Shaolin Temple in 1982. Audiences were introduced to Li as a Buddhist monk who practiced martial arts only when he was forced to defend the innocent. The story was very simple and innocent. The young monk, played by Jet, made you believe that no matter how difficult your life or situation was, if you don't give up and don't surrender, then everything will work out. There was less theatrical movie tricks and more of a guy who could do this stuff, who could do broadsword style or could do open hand style and could do any physical gymnastic thing that was called for him. And he was so quick, so fast. He wasn't afraid of the camera because for all those years he was performing and doing exhibitions, uh, cameras were always around. It was a great swordplay movie and it was just the Shaolin monks and you know the fantasy of it. The movie was such a big hit at the time when it came out. Everyone was struggling to make their life better and this movie was such a morale booster. After it was released he got almost a hundred thousand fan letters which he would have loved to reply to all of them, but it just got overwhelming. Buddhist monks were advisors on the set of Shaolin Temple. They planted the seeds of a Buddhist faith in Jet Li that would blossom years later. They had some Shaolin monks on the set who would tell him, I see you know, Buddhism in your future. And he had always had it in the back of his mind that he wanted to grow in more than just being a Wushu master. He wanted to be more well-rounded. And so I think he had it in the back of his mind that he should explore Buddhism. A Philippine distributor, amazed by how fast Lee could move, changed his screen name to Jet. It stuck, and Jet Li became an overnight Asian movie star. The posters were always very big, and they were always a pit. The posters of the movies were always him, you know, just a close-up of him. Jet Li, by that time, was an attractive young man, sort of rather petite in stature, and so he was regarded as this cute young uh, new screen star. He's really handsome, he's chiseled, and he has these amazing eyes, and there's something about those cheekbones and the proportions of his face which are uh, very captivating. The first hit would lead to two more Shaolin Temple movies. Lee's girlfriend, Wushu artist Wong Chi Yen, joined him on screen for the sequels. And in 1987, they were married. She came from a little bit richer family than he did. He came from really very poor surroundings. And so he felt a little obligation because of the almost unsaid caste system of if you're richer, then I must look up to you and must be more supportive. He described it as a marriage of convenience. He, she would uh, give his, his family financial help. And it was described as a loveless marriage. Though Lee was now a huge Asian film star, he was not getting rich making movies in China. I think he was paid 25 cents a day or something like that. I mean, it was just some ridiculous amount of uh, non-money. Lee was intrigued by Jackie Chan, a Hong Kong martial artist who was starring in American movies like Cannonball Run. 
I think Jet's motivation was to, to build a, a bigger career, an international career, an American career specifically, like he had seen Jackie Chan do so successfully. He knew that Jackie Chan, he had read in the papers, had come to the States and was starting to make a much better movie than he had in China. We got a two-year work visa for America. But when he arrived, he found his poor English skills and small stature were barriers. Jet obviously wanted to build his American career in California. He had one major stumbling block, and that was English. He was very disillusioned almost very quickly when he arrived in Los Angeles and discovered that uh, Hollywood did not have open arms for somebody who was of rather short stature, somebody who was not the typical Caucasian, somebody who spoke English very little, very poorly, and also had a heavy accent. Lee couldn't find work on American films. Instead, he landed a part in the Hong Kong action movie shot in San Francisco called Dragon Fight. His co-star was former Miss Asia Pacific, Nina Lee Chi. It was love at first sight. She was destined to be his. She was a very beautiful girl from Shanghai. She had studied in the States. She had gone back to China and made films over there. And then she was hired for this picture. He immediately had feelings for her. Um, and it was difficult because he was still married to, to Wang. And, and he said, uh, if we still feel this way, he said to her, after 10 years, you know, then we should get married. And she said, I will, I'll wait 10 years. Since he was so in love with her and couldn't get her out of his mind, his marriage broke up. Lee and Huang divorced in 1990. And while he was free now to be with Nina Lee Chi, Jet kept to his word and would wait 10 years before marrying the woman he loved. First, he would return to Asia to seek his fortune in Hong Kong's booming film business. By the late 1980s, Jet Li was a proven martial arts film star in Asia, but had trouble breaking into Hollywood on his first try. So after two frustrating years in California, he returned to Asia in 1989, this time to the busy Hong Kong movie scene. When things weren't going quite Jet's way in America, he jetted back to Hong Kong, signed with Golden Harvest Pictures, which was a leading producer of some of the big martial arts movies back then. The Hong Kong film industry, I guess, was the biggest of the Asian film industries, and they really did these chop sake kind of um, movies. The martial arts movies were just popular. So when you could find someone uh, of the caliber of a national champion martial artist, you know, four times running, you know, and young and good looking, and put him in the movies, uh, you know, it seems like uh, you were getting the real thing. Golden Harvest offered Jet the chance to play the historical hero Wang Fei Hung in the epic film series Once Upon a Time in China. He played a hero from the 19th century, this acupuncturist, herbalist, philosopher, who also was a tremendous fighter, sort of like a folk hero. So the public could blur the line between Jet Li, the modern hero of Wushu, and the modern famous person, this historical personage. Li wanted much more control over his films, and he wanted to earn more money. As he grew in popularity, Jet Li, he found himself clashing particularly with Sui Hark, who was the director of these films. And each of them had naturally a large ego because they both were very talented. Each had their own vision of what should be done. And so Jet Li increasingly felt, well, this is not the way things should be. I should be having more control over what I see as the future of my career. Jet hired Jim Choi, a tough Hong Kong agent with a tougher task. Much of the lucrative film scene was controlled by triad underground gangs. A lot of the Hong Kong filmmaking was controlled by the underworld. And Jet Li, being very idealistic and uh, not happy with this, was trying to pull away from those elements involved in that kind of filmmaking. And of course, it's very hard to do since they controlled so much of it at the time. Jim Choi was hired by Jet Li to not only get him out of his contract with Golden Harvest, but also to help him get the money that he felt he deserved as a leading man. Several months later, negotiations to free Li from his contract were underway when Choi was murdered in Kowloon. In April of 1992, he was shot to death in his office building. <laughs> that was sort of like a little lesson to Jet Li, uh, be very careful because uh, nobody's too great to be eliminated. There's kind of like uh, murky things surrounding that, the details of that, that 
how that happened and who was responsible. It was believed that it was a triad murder because the triad does control or did control a lot of Hong Kong filmmaking back then. The scandal over Choi's killing pressured Golden Harvest to release Jet from his contract. He took control of his career and was soon on his way to becoming as famous as his childhood movie hero, Bruce Lee. Jet Li, as a child, one of the first films he ever recalled seeing or talked about was seeing Fist of Fury, which was Bruce Lee's picture in 1972. And that was a study of the martial arts school and the relationship between the master and his students. In 1994, Lee made Fist of Legend, a remake of Bruce Lee's classic kung fu film, Fist of Fury. Some critics consider Fist of Legend the best kung fu movie ever made. Comparisons between Jet Li and Bruce Lee were inevitable. It was in a scene in the courtyard where he was sparring with someone. And, you know, the speed, the quickness, the execution, and the style, and, and his, his, the style, it just had a beauty about it. And it, it all, all the, the components about it, it was very, uh, a complete kind of martial artist. And, uh, just performed very really well. The reason that more people think of him as a Bruce Lee style is his speed and accuracy. Bruce was the pioneer. Bruce was the one who made Jet possible. Without Bruce conquering the worldwide cinema, the next martial artist to come up and be extraordinary would have had to fight a whole other set of battles. Once people began to see Jet, they found the successor to the guy they first fell in love with. Martial arts fans in America, including director Quentin Tarantino, were now keen to help Lee make the move to Hollywood. You know, he always liked a Hong Kong action film. I met him 10 years ago, uh, 10 years ago in Hong Kong. I remember he's a very famous director, but uh, he, he went to Hong Kong to see me, you know, where we have a very nice talk. Selling the trade papers, you'd see Jet Li being considered for this part, Jet Li being considered for that part. Now, maybe many of the people reading the trade papers didn't know who he was, but the people who the filmmakers and producers of action films, uh, they became aware of him. And part of that was thanks to Quentin Tarantino's trumpeting Jet Li. Jet's break came when he was offered a role in Lethal Weapon 4, part of the hugely popular Mel Gibson, Danny Glover, Buddy Cop series. Warner Brother invited me to come to Little Weapon 4. Then I have a chance to work with a lot of great actor, actress in Hollywood. But Lee would have to compromise the heroic screen image he had cultivated in Asia to play a bad guy in Little Weapon 4. Jackie Chan had already turned down the role, so he would not disappoint his Asian fans. Jackie said, I have never played villains up until now. I am not going to change that. You know, my audiences know that I'm going to save the day one way or another. Next in their pecking list came to Jet Li, and uh, he, through negotiations, decided yes, he would do it, because he thought this was a great opportunity to be in a major American picture, to learn the ropes, and to get uh, some sort of uh, appeal to an audience that really didn't know him. Because Lee's English was limited, producers made his character a strong, silent type. It was a device that would be repeated in later Hollywood projects. His English was not very good, so they tailor-made the part of the villain in Lethal Weapon 4 so that he would speak very rarely, but carry a big stick, so to speak, and get into a lot of uh, combats with Mel Gibson. There is that blip of translation between what he knows in his mind and what he will say vocally. And I think some of the subtleties go away in that area. But in any language, he still brings the authority of who he is. Lethal Weapon 4 opened at number one in the U.S. in July of 1998. But Jet's Asian fans weren't happy to see their screen hero play an evil character. American audiences who didn't know him were thrilled. They loved it. His Asian fans were a little unsure because he was playing such a villain. And he didn't have very many lines. His, his English wasn't up to par quite yet. But I think there were a lot of people were happy that he's breaking into the American market. His role was a you know was a heavy it was a bad guy and it was well done as far as all the fight choreography and stuff. I, I personally wanted to see him come out as you know as a good guy, but you know he did a pretty good job with that that role. I preferred the roles he played in his Hong Kong or China movies than his role in the Li 
looking forward and for. However, as an Asian actor, I would love to see more and more Asian faces participate in American movies. That would give more and more opportunities for us to show our talents. Jet Li was on the radar in Hollywood. Now he was looking for his first leading role in America. It was very important that he pick his roles properly because one false move and he could end up back running back to Hong Kong to make movies there. On and off. Jet Li had been a martial arts film star for 15 years before finding North American success in Lethal Weapon 4 in 1998. But when another leading role came along, he surprisingly turned it down. In 1999, he married Nina Lishi, and just as he had promised in 10 years that everything worked out, they both still loved each other, they would wed, and they did. Jet Li and Nina Lishi had remained in love for a decade. Finally, they were married. Lee would put his career second to his wife. After that marriage, soon thereafter, she became pregnant. And at that time, Jet Li had been approached to do Crouching Tiger. And uh, he wanted to do the part. He knew he could do it very well. But he had promised his wife that uh, if she were pregnant, he would be on hand during her maternity period and not be away. So he turned down that part. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was directed by Ang Lee. It would be nominated for 10 Oscars and win four. Yes, he would like to have this career. He would love to have a Jackie Chan career, but he puts you know, family ahead of just about any, any other move. Lee was still looking for a leading role in Hollywood. He found it in Romeo Must Die, a loose retelling of the Shakespeare tragedy, Romeo and Juliet. Lee's co-star, Russell Wong, was impressed with Jet's intensity on set. Watching uh, and working with him on Romeo Must Die, he's really focused on what he wanted to do, what he wanted to achieve. He's very focused on how his character would fight and how my character would fight and every aspect of the fight choreography. Over the next few years, Jet Li's movies would swing in style to please his two culturally different audiences. Romeo Must Die was designed to make the veteran Asian martial arts star into a leading man in Western films. I just remember when we shot Romeo Must Die, uh, how we kind of shared the same experience about how tough it was um, breaking in in the U.S. film. Romeo on the Sky was a good film for him, for new, again, for new fans. New fans loved to see it. They thought this was what he was. This was somebody who was into these special effects and wire work. He was a great believer in the feedback between he and his fans, or he and people who came to his webpage. And he read with great interest and reaction how people reacted to the movies he made and what they missed about the old Jet Li pictures versus the new. Western directors were using wires and pulleys to suspend the martial arts stars in the air during fight scenes, creating slow motion effects that North American audiences liked. But Asian purists weren't as happy with his Asian fans, however, didn't like the rap music, they didn't like the wire work, they didn't like all the special effects. They said, you're such a good martial artist, you don't need all this. They thought a guy like Jet Li had what it took to not, you know, have that safety net. Romeo Must Die was directed by Joel Silver and co-starred hip-hop singing star Aaliyah in the Juliet role. It was a new blend of elements in the classic tale of forbidden love. You know, use hip-hop music with martial arts. So Silver's idea, you know, since Romeo must die until now, you know, uh, we hope they work. <laughs> there was this whole kind of movie that, that we hadn't really seen before. You throw in the, the Hong Kong action people, you throw in the music people, you throw in a rapper, and you see what comes out of it. There were other creative challenges facing Lee. His conservative Asian fans would not accept a love scene between Lee and Aaliyah. I believe the audience is a real boss. They pay the money to watch film. Trying to adapt this image to his American film, Romeo Must Die, they said, well, let's make them romantically touch as far as being in the same place, but let's not have any great love scenes because Jet Li would be too uncomfortable doing this. Jed was always careful to protect his audience from the new directions his career was taking. So when Lee made a violent movie like 2001's Kiss of a Dragon, he warned all his young fans to stay away. 
because it was so brutal. He knew that he had fans who had children who would want to go see the PG-13 version, but because this was an R-rated movie, he put a message on his message board, this is not for your children. Wait for the next movie. The next movie will be PG-13, and then you can take them to see this. This is for the adults. I always, you know, just tell the audience, especially young audience, that they, you know, movies like magic. You can make everything happen on the film. But then learning something by yourself is fake. You know, it's very dangerous. Right. We only can watch a film, you know, ten people, you know, you know, just not necessarily need to, you know, do something at home. Lee used his personal website to make his fans part of his filmmaker. He even used a fan poll for casting choices for 2003's Cradle to the Grave. Goes over, uh, ask who's the best guy to play the villain on this film. Um, my sister Beaver had some idea to say find uh, people's name put on the, my website to ask audience. So then everybody vote. Mark get um, the highest number. And then I put it out, send to the show. Say, oh, here's the guy. Sometimes he does listen to his fans and try to please everyone. Other times, though, he will admit I can't please everyone. So even though he, he can't please everyone, he tries. Jet Li's film career in the West was gathering steam, and Lee would find a way to bridge the divide between his two audiences when his next Asian film would go to number one in the United States. By 2002, Jet Li had cracked the North American movie market with films like Lethal Weapon 4, Romeo Must Die, and The One. Then Lee returned to China to make the epic period film Hero, directed by Yi Mu Zhang. I'm not a hero. <laughs> hero was one of the biggest Chinese movies uh, to be made, and it was going to be along the lines of Crouching Tiger. It was about the first emperor of China and how uh, he, uh, this guy becomes his bodyguard because he saves him, the emperor and, and, and what happens. And Jet Li is that bodyguard. He has the aura, he has the authority, he has the looks, and uh, oh God knows who's got a skill set. Miramax held the North American rights to the film and withheld it from release for two years. They picked release dates for them, and then uh, those release dates would come and go, and then they'd pick other release dates, and they'd schedule them in, and then two years went by, still no hero on American screens, and the fans are going nuts, and DVD copies are making their way to America, black market copies. Quentin Tarantino had made several pictures for Miramax, and so they had a good relationship. And so because he bugged them uh, that, oh, they should release this picture, he had seen prints of it, uh, they decided to say, Quentin Tarantino presents. This way, even though Tarantino was not part of the film, they got the advantage of his box office name on the marquee. Jet Li was the star of the first foreign language film ever to make number one in its opening weekend in the United States. It was that weekend's uh, number one film by a wide margin, took everybody by surprise. There's something very electric about Jet and very classic. This is why I think he spans centuries so easily because there's an essential humanity to him that that we like to feel is got the size of an historical person. Hero was like the perfect film for Jet Li. It brings in so many elements. It brings in historical element. It brings in all the wire work you want to see and uh, terrific characters. In Hero, Li's character spares a ruthless emperor whose intentions are good. The film appealed to Li's Buddhist belief in the balance of good and evil. It was just something about the whole nature of Buddhism that he was learning and the nature of violence that he was perpetrating in a sense on, on film that was in conflict, you know, until, you know, he started to really understand that, well, you're a good guy, you're a bad guy, this is the way it is, this is the way these films are, <clears throat> and these are the stories they tell, and they tell it through this means. I think all these things that give him this ability to float through a sea of enemies in a mass of scenes like in uh, Once Upon a Time in China, one, two, three, four, you know, or Hero, to stand there amidst the, the enemy comes right from the metaphors of the Buddha. Li's Buddhist faith had been gradually growing since he first met monks on the set of Shaolin Temple in 1982. 
He had sensed from a young age that his life was part of a larger spiritual threat. He always felt like right from the beginning when he was four or five years old and he had the ability to do martial arts movements and all in a way that the others couldn't. And it wasn't something that was like totally new for some reason. He probably practiced Buddhism the way he practiced martial arts. So that's with a pretty intent discipline. Buddhists believe in reincarnation and the pursuit of enlightenment through meditation. He felt with Buddhism that that explained it in this way, you know, that, that we do come back. There's a yin and yang to everything and uh, that you have past knowledge of certain things and this is what made him, in a sense, calm. For Lee, inner peace and martial arts didn't always sit well together. He had grown tired of making violent action movies and even considered leaving show business. One of the things that Jet Li was feeling was that he had made enough movies that they were repeating themselves and he didn't want to have kids repeating lines that they were in the movie, go, you know, die, you, you know, I'll kill you. He was so pleased with where his career was and satisfied with the money that he had made and more than satisfied with his family life that he thought, I've done everything I, I, I set out to do. What more can anybody ask? Ironically, it was a peaceful Buddhist monk who convinced Lee to use his martial arts career to promote his faith around the world. He was involved very much with Lo Kusang, who was sort of a disciple of the Tibetan Buddhism. And it was, in fact, it was this Buddhist monk that uh, was very strongly influential in Jet continually in movie making and helping him understand that as a famous person, he would have a much bigger form, a much bigger way of telling the world about Buddhism. Lee's faith grew after he faced death in the Asian tsunami of 2004. Suddenly the big waves came in and he was trying to guide his daughter to safety at the time it happened and he was hit in the leg by some floating piece of furniture. Now Jet, being in the Maldives, the Maldives are like four feet above sea level. The giant wave overtook Lee and his daughter, but he managed to pull her to safety. Living through the disaster had a profound impact on Lee. He believed his life was spared for a reason. I think that Buddhism allowed him to come to grips with death, which means you, are, you come to grips with your life, you come to grips with the nature of fate, and it all becomes one. It really affected him greatly. He said it was one of the most powerful impacts he had ever had in his life. He saw that this was a tourist area. And so there were people from all over the world, all different backgrounds. You had, you know, bellboys from the locals, and then you had very rich people coming to visit, and they were all helping each other. Jet Li had spent his life focused on building an international career from his modest Beijing beginnings. Now that he had escaped death in the Asian tsunami, Li would dedicate his life to saving others. <laughs> Jet Li and his family narrowly escaped death in the Asian tsunami of 2004. Suddenly for Li, being an international martial arts and film star seemed much less important. Because of that experience, he definitely treasures everything. He treasures his family more, he treasures his friends more, everything around him. He, every day is a beautiful day. He told me, life is short and you got to do for others and you've got to, to act on that desire in the present. Lee witnessed people of all races and backgrounds helping each other in the wake of the killer wave. They were all helping each other, they were all helping other people. It didn't matter where they were from, they didn't ask who are you, where are you from, I'll help you if I want to. It was they had to pitch in and I think this was the genesis for the One Foundation. Lee teamed up with the International Red Cross to create a charitable foundation called the One. The One Foundation is a really wonderful um, collaboration between Jet Li and the American Red Cross where it's very simple, it's one dollar from one person once a month. He has worked out a lot of ways to get support because the burden of it is spread so widely that he really can generate a lot of capital. It not only goes towards disaster relief but it also helps um, mental health issues for young children and young adults. I respect Jeff for using his status and power to help others who are less fortunate. This is a man who makes millions of dollars, but he gives away a lot of money as well. This is one of his great hopes and one of his plans for his future is to make this foundation, the one, become much more important. These days, Jet Li is at peace with himself. 
helping others through his charity and making popular movies. In Asia, he's known as someone who's very charitable and very peaceful, who is also, of course, a great martial artist. In Hollywood, they just know he's kick butt Jet Li. In 2008, Jet teamed up with two other martial arts legends in big budget fantasy romps aimed to please all of his fans. First up, Forbidden Kingdom with Jackie Chan. We talk about it 10 years ago when we were working in Hong Kong. We said, work, you know, make a film together, but it didn't happen. If you could have Jet Li and Jackie Chan in a movie, you want them to fight. You gotta see a fight between Jackie and Jet. Then who's gonna be the good guy? Who's gonna be the bad guy? And with Forbidden Kingdom, this was solved. Chan and Lee's characters have an epic combat scene, but then team up against a common enemy. So neither martial arts star had to lose the fight. Everyone was excited. It was a big deal for every, everyone who was involved. Of course, it was also a huge deal for martial art fans. Well, fight with Jack, so comfortable. You, do, you don't worry about it. In Lee's second 2008 film, he played the evil Emperor Han in The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. Director Rob Cohen let Lee speak his native Mandarin. There's a very big difference between Jet and the two languages. In, in Chinese, his voice actually relaxes and gets deeper, and he has much more tonal, nuancial control of everything, including the physical mask through which he speaks, the face, the, the hands, the, the, the whole physical presentation. Cohen first connected with Lee through their common Buddhist beliefs. And the first thing he does is look down at my wrist and he sees this set of amber mala beads and he says, you know, what are those? Uh, they're Tibetan. And I said, yeah, these are my Tibetan mala beads. I practice Buddhism. And we began to talk about certain Buddhist ideas and that was an immediate connection between us. At the end of shooting, he gave me this set of blue amber beads as a gift from his own amber collection because I had been admiring his beads and, and it was just, I wear them every day. In The Mummy, Jet fights Asia's greatest female martial arts star, Michelle Yeoh. Cohen was thrilled to direct the epic showdown. We began to work out the ballet of it and with a little bit of wire assist and a lot of training that both these great Chinese actors brought to the job, I was able to do something that I felt was both beautiful and, and vicious and effective. Action actors don't just have to show their action skills. They also needed to show their acting skills in order to make the audience believe that they are in danger. Jet Li has come a very long way from his humble beginnings in a poor Beijing suburb. It's kind of amazing when you look at somebody who grew up in a poor family that not only to become famous at the age of 11, 12, 13 in his homeland, but he grew to become famous around the entire world. Now in his 40s, Lee aspires to make films that have no fight scenes at all. He is trying to get to do more acting, straight acting, than less uh, fighting, although he's having some trouble getting people to accept him because they want to see Jet Li kick butt. Jet would really love to make a movie called Tibetan Monk in New York. It would be it's a, a very different kind of fish out of water story, but a classic fish out of water story. And getting financing has been all but impossible for him because this film would have absolutely no martial arts sequences. You can't be the fastest gun on the block forever. I think he's getting just more seasoned as an actor. My belief is that he'll gravitate more towards film producing as a way to get his vision encompassed and maybe foster some younger stars in the field. When I think of Jet Li, I'm gonna borrow a line from uh, West Side Story. When you're Jet, you're Jet all the way because he's a man who has amazing commitment, amazing, uh, uh, amazing self-discipline, and he knows what he wants. He's like the Varishnikov of martial arts and then some. I think he's done a lot more than just being a martial artist. I think he's achieved quite a bit on a, on a national level. That's his karma, maybe. The thing that distinguished him from millions of other wannabe martial arts slash actors was that 
essence that he wants to be a symbol of protection to the entire Chinese people. He has always emerged as the man who is a symbol to the billion.